I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. This episode is part one of a four part series featuring design experts from across the globe. And this episode features Thomas Rayner, Principal Designer at Phyto Studio in Virginia and co-author of the book Planting in a Post-Wild World. If you've listened to previous episodes of the podcast, you'll know I've never carried advertising or sponsorship and you'll also probably have gathered that it's something I've always been sceptical of. I don't interview anyone whose work I don't believe has merit and I've always said I wouldn't accept sponsorship or advertising or talk to or about anyone or anything that I don't believe in and I'm really proud that I've stuck to that which is why I'm delighted to say that this Design Expert series is sponsored by the London College of Garden Design. If you're a regular listener, you will also know that I attended the London College of Garden Design myself in 2014, and I am always banging on about what a brilliant place it is to study if you're looking to get into garden design. In fact, I will say hand on heart, I think it's the best course for garden designers in the UK. This is something I've always said, both publicly and privately, and now I'm actually getting paid to say it, so I feel like I'm winning. If you'd like to find out more about the college, you can visit their website, which is www.lcgd.org.uk. And there will be links to the website and all their social media accounts in the show notes. And do stay tuned until the end of the interview, because Thomas is actually visiting the UK in January for a full day planting masterclass. And this has been organised by Gillian Goodson and the London College of Garden Design. And I'll give you information at the end about where you can get tickets if you'd like to come along. And I'm going to be there. So if you come, it'd be really good to meet you. So back to Thomas and the interview. I started out by asking him about his views on our natural environment, particularly in our towns and cities. And I asked him how and why we should manage them going forwards. In your book, Planting in a Post-Wild World... You do take a pragmatic approach to our wild landscapes and you seem to accept that we can't turn back the clock to any time in the past. Is that a fair summary? And and what does that mean for gardeners and designers going forward? Yes, I I think that is fair. A big emphasis in our book was really uh, to address um, what in the United States is kind of a growing divide in the gardening world between um, those um, who are very passionate about native plants um, and and kind of more traditional contemporary gardeners who you know are, are really uh, more on the design end of the spectrum. And uh, for us, we felt like it was a very unproductive debate. And I, I think what we really wanted to emphasize was um, getting away from this notion of uh, a, this uh, this idea that we can return turn the clock back. You know, we just didn't feel like it was very um, pragmatic. And I think there was a tendency um, with some um, in uh, more ecologically oriented um, uh, to, to think, you know, there's the, the potential of restoration. And uh, I think when you look at restorations, we're, we're um, engaged very often in visiting places that have been restored um, or are actively um, in some state of uh, restoration, whether it's a prairie or or a woodland, where they're actively being managed, and, and it's very clear that the, the, you know there is no going back. Even those spaces, as much effort is being put into them um, to keep them in a, in a higher quality, more biodiverse state, they don't. Um, we can't replicate what's gone, and it's never going to come back. And I think that that really shifts planting design when, when you kind of fundamentally accept that. It's a hard hard statement. It's not a very optimistic one, but I I think once you can accept um, the reality of the the times we're living in, I think it frees us as designers to really be pragmatic about what we can do in the confetti of green spaces we have and in the places we live. You know, what what can we really do with our allotments and our small gardens and our public spaces? Um, what, What is actually achievable? And, you know, in terms of uh, preserving the Amazon rainforest, that may not be able to happen in those kind of spaces. But in terms of, you know, providing robust habitat for pollinators, um, there's uh, wonderful evidence to show that um, what happens in our, our cities and in those areas is, is in- incredibly important to, to many of those. So, so I think it's, it's just encouraging all 
designers and um, gardeners to really um, take a, a a very uh, pragmatic uh, solution, uh, but but to be bold uh, within within that lens. Mm-hmm. So I did think that your book dealt with the treatment of what you refer to as the built environment, um, which seemed to be very much urban and suburban landscapes. And I was wondering, would your approach change to planting if you were in a kind of wilder, more rural area? Yeah, that's a really good question. I I, I think context is everything. um, And and I think uh, our approach would change quite a bit. I, I still think you know the, this plant community approach is is a tool that's relevant to any context, uh, but in a more rural environment, I think we would be responding um, much more to um, an agricultural context, or very often there's an existing natural context that becomes um, a, a vital uh, part of what we're responding to. So, for example, hedgerows or ex- existing woodlands or um, some patch of meadow or grassland that is existing um, is the the thing that we're responding to in the most uh, fundamental way. I think first we're very often kind of trying to understand what is the if you did nothing. That's the first question we ask. If you did nothing in the site, what would happen? And in a rural area, there's, there tend to be other forces, whether it's the agricultural land management or um, you know, the presence of a forest or seed bank that's currently there, that if you just walked away, what would happen in that site? And so a lot of our work is about guiding, um, planting uh, along a path that's very sympathetic with what could happen. Sometimes it's a very big change from that. It's not about just letting things go, but it's it's about um, understanding the trajectory and working with it. Um, I think the other big thing in a rural area that really changes is in a rural area, you have uh, land management is as important, if not more important, than design. And I think we're we're really interested in really keen on the idea of land management as as really a design tool. And it's very different in urban. I mean, gardening and maintenance always matter no matter where you are. But kind of in a in a, in a rural area, what you can do little actions over time end up having a much bigger effect on a meadow or a woodland or something else than, than anything you can plant in a single shot, you know, in, in one setting. So uh, I think for us, it's really understanding adaptive management um, as a really robust tool um, that can change a site. I mean, we can really radically change a woodland or a meadow hedgerow um, over time uh, with, with much less cost, much less energy, much less um capital investments of new plants um, by by a much more iterative long-term approach. So I, I think that's what we're really excited with that. We, we have quite a few um, projects, estates that are in rural areas. And, um, you know, it, it's a much different toolkit. It, it's still the same plant community toolkit, but it's just a much different toolkit than we would happen in, a, in an urban site where you have a lot more control over the soil and the uh, design Mm-hmm. Um, in, in this way. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously you are a designer and you are brought in to design a space. Um, but conceivably, mm-hmm. there are landscapes where you could actually say, well, this doesn't need any interruption. This will heal itself. This will, as you say, the seed bank will take over. This this piece of land will, you know, come to its own kind of natural conclusion. And sometimes I wonder if, if what we present people with in cities is a you, you, and I think you describe it actually as a kind of uh, it, it is there is a degree of artifice in it. If we present people sure. that view of nature in inverted commas, will they be less accepting of spaces that are wilder and are in transition? If they feel if they come to read nature as a kind of a pumped up version of of what it is and what it, it would be if it was left to its own devices, is, is that a worry? I don't, I mean, for me, it's not a worry. I, I think the more, one of the fundamental shifts I'm always interested in kind of putting out into the world is a shift away from understanding nature as something um, apart from humanity. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity this May to travel with uh, James Hitchman and Tom Stewart Smith and a few other um, uh, planting designers in China. 
And we went up to the kind of the peaks of the Himalayas, uh, looking at natural vegetation and where, where I was expecting to find utter wilderness. Um, what, what was so remarkable was that these beautiful alpine meadows that we went to see only were possible because someone let their yak out and grazed it, you know, for, in the, in the national park they they were letting, um, so it's this idea that, you know, what we think of as wilderness is really somebody else's culture. We don't always understand, um, in the same way, I think there's always been, um, whether here in the United States with the native Americans burning and allowing bison to graze things, um, there's always been, um, the hand of man in landscapes and, and very often, um, for our, our benefit, but also for the benefit of biodiversity. And I think in many ways, part of the biodiversity crisis that's happening in America right now is there are, people are not doing land management anymore. You know, there's no, nobody's grazing the, the land anymore and everything's reverting to forest and not only forest, but just reverting to a kind of invasive dominated, um, uh, palette where with uh, invasive exotics are really totally taking over the native ecology here uh, because we're just totally stopping land management. Um, so really, an, I think the great irony of the future for biodiversity is that in, in some ways we have to embrace artifice in the most um, bold way possible because the future requires us to garden the wild you know, we can't, these national parks really require land management in order to keep them high quality. If you, if you walk away and do nothing, uh, biodiversity drops in, in many of these areas. And then at the same time, so why we garden the wild? We have to wild our gardens. You know, we have to get more biodiversity. We have to get more functionality in our small spaces. So the, the thing that's common in both, whether it's these are our, our more wild spaces or our our own gardens is this idea of, of wilding and gardening. You know, that they're both inherently there. We have to kind of embrace natural processes in a more robust way, but, but we can't, we have to embrace artifice as natural. And there's nothing, you know, I, I think that dichotomy where, where nature and, and humanity is, is somehow seen as two ends of the spectrum uh, is really, I think, part of the problem. And, and, the, the more we kind of start embracing our role as stewards and as gardeners, uh, even in you know huge national parks and reserves, um, the, the the better the impact, the more responsibility we can start taking and, and really change, mm-hmm. change things for the better. So part of the problem, I guess, there is, as you said, there's the invasives in the landscape and some of those will have come in from the horticultural trade. How can we mitigate that against that in the future? If we can't, we don't have a crystal ball and a lot of times we will be using species where we're not entirely sure of the impact were they to escape into the wild. How can designers particularly avoid that problem? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a really tough problem. We're, we're working um, on landscapes now here in America. We're working uh, 300 acres right now near an airport in the mid-Atlantic. And uh, every square inch of the site is dominated by some of the worst invasive species, um, you know, up and down the I-95 corridors, up, up to the big um, north-south highway along the East Coast. Um, total uh, invasive ecology, you know, almost no biodiversity, monocultures of the most aggressive sluggish plants. So in order to do something more biodiverse, more ecological, it's going to require huge effort to remove the invasives uh, heavily through um, targeted herbicides um, that will be a permanent part of the, the long-term management, which is a really tough piece. Then the establishment of a more native ecology, and then, you know, we're but that has to be permanently uh, gardened, essentially. I mean, it, it permanently has to be uh, kept. Uh, the invasive... I mean, in certain parts of the world, um, invasives are so dominant. I mean, here, here in the East Coast of America, um, the whole eastern deciduous forest is uh, really uh, on is, is is tipping toward decline as invasives really take over the, the whole piece, and uh, the native trees are are so diseased. So, I mean, it really is. We have to understand. I think as designers, how can we design within a context in which um, aggressive generalists are dominating all of our ecosystems. 
um, and how do we create more biodiversity in some of these? And so, and so some, in some of the cases, um, in a lot of our projects, we're embracing more stressful habitats. Um, so, uh, you know, planting in gravel, uh, planting in, in more stressful soils so that we can get more biodiverse plantings and kind of exclude some of the more invasive species. Um, obviously we, we don't introduce any new ones. Um, but you know, in, in some places like, like where we work here in the mid Atlantic, it's, um, the danger of introducing new ones, I think, is um, much less than, than you know just the fact that the ones that are here are are, are so dominant over everything. So it really requires a, a very different, I think, lens um, and restoration and kind of a purist approach to native plants. I I think don't offer a lot of tools. Um, in, in that kind of in where we where we need triage i mean we're in the middle of the extinction crisis and you know we need triage and we just need tools that can work um for scale and within the budgets that public agencies have um and, and once you start kind of focusing on it, solving that problem cracking that nut um then i think you start getting beyond some of that ideal um idealistic thinking and the nostalgic thinking of of um, some of the restoration school and, and really start looking at what, what tools do we have that could really work in an area like this. Yeah, actually, that leapfrogs a little bit onto one of my later questions, which was, um, I think that a lot of your designs uh, kind of rely on ongoing skilled maintenance, which has almost an artistic bent to it. And in does involve a certain intuitive element and a very knowledgeable element up to it because somebody needs to know how planting design is going to develop uh, going beyond sure. the original design. So how do you ensure that happens once the design has been implemented in view of the fact that there is possibly a skilled labour shortage, certainly in the UK, I think, um, and, and also sure. budgetary constraints? How do, you, how do you deal with that? Sure. So um, for... M- Almost all of our projects, um, when we design a planting design, we, we're very often thinking of our, we're thinking about what plant systems are the most will, will match the site, and will also match. One of the first questions we always ask is, you know, what level of maintenance or management is possible, and so that really guides the design of the system that's going to be there. Um, so, in in some places, for example, if there's going to be a diverse herbaceous mix. We would be careful not to put uh, certain shrubs in the middle of that mix because we would know the only way this public agency can maintain it is, is once a year to bring a big mower and, and mow it all down. Um, you know, not not hand pruning and and selective. Um, you know, it's not not a perennial border. It's um, these robust mixes that that require that kind of response. Um, you know, in, in more garden settings where there's a possibility of maintenance, there's a lot more we can do. Uh, especially, I think the, the more exciting thing with some of these mixes is playing with short-lived um, herbaceous species, perennials, uh, which tend to you know flower quite a bit, uh, but be very dynamic. I think with, with the gardener, uh, we can play with those a lot more. But in, in more public settings, I think we're really looking for much more stable uh, combinations uh, that can be managed with kind of heavy machine machinery that a public agency might have. So it really is about matching the, the management strategy in the plant system to the site and the client. And I think when we do that, we can find the right fits. But, but even then, it's, it's not, I mean, very often we're replacing lawn or turf or, or, or some type of system that requires much more maintenance with a, a planted system that requires much less the big difference is it requires a different kind of maintenance than most people know how to do. And so a lot of the effort early on is really educating the client and and really trying to get their investment in teaching whatever labor force is going to be managing the planting, how to do it, you know, how to do it differently. Um, It it can be much less labor, but it just, it's more um, adaptive and responsive. Very often it helps for us to have, longer term contracts where we come out a couple times a year and meet with whoever's maintaining it and having a few conversations, make adjustments, uh, doing replantings here and there. Um, so it's a different relationship. And I think it changes when we're meeting with the client early on, we're spending a lot of time, um, in the very beginning kind of talking about here, 
the big idea and how it'll be maintained and what they can do and what resources they have and what's required um, so that we can design something that hopefully fits within the, the budget and the division um, so it can be maintained. It's not easy. I, I don't want to make it sound like we have it all figured out. I, I think, you know, the, the, the management and maintenance question is a really great one that you raise, especially as we're moving to a different type of planting. Um, but it, it, it's fundamental, I think, to, to all everything. And the, and the more, um, I think, the more we can get people interested in horticulture again. Uh, I, I think this is part of why I think so much of our message um, is trying to be optimistic about um, what hort- you know, the horticulture is no longer just the parsley around the, the pot roast of our buildings, but that it can really, um, plants can be the thing that changes, you know, the future. And, and I think when young people, gardeners and, and understand that they're not just uh, shrubbing up something for uh, the, the uber elite, um, but better doing something fundamental to the future, I think it's, it's a vision of planting that um, I hope could be more attractive to um people and and, and bring them into the profession in a new and more vibrant way Mm, i hope so too i really do um and your designs are um you know they they involve plant community so i think sometimes when people look at those and they're switching from as you say lawn to that it looks actually very high maintenance but in reality it isn't which like you say it's a different type of maintenance but what i thought was really interesting in your book was that you split your landscapes into three broad archetypes types of of plant communities um, for the purposes of categorizing planting so i know it's a really big question but is it possible for you to give an overview of those three archetypes yeah sure i think for us because uh, we're dealing with uh, diverse plant systems the the most important that that could be inherently messy right it means it's more complicated it's more layered it's just there's more um, about it the more dynamic so I, I think as a framework to all that what what for us is really really important and, and something that's a big part of our design process is understanding these systems within a few very simple um, universally appealing archetypes. So we, we're stealing some uh, Carl Jung uh, vocabulary there, but really the, the idea is that no matter what, no matter where you are in the world, um, at least in the temperate world, maybe not you know the polar ice caps or the, the Amazon forest, but at least in the temperate world, there are some basic plant community patterns that tend to be uh, more or less um, universal. And the three that people can split these up into many different categories, but the ways that we did it in our book was to describe uh, plant communities along a gradient of tree coverage. It's really what this is. So first there's forest, and this is when trees are touching. Uh, the middle condition is kind of a woodland, or in some conditions it becomes more like a shrubland. You see in Mediterranean or, or chaparral, um, or even steppe environments sometimes. So this is where there's uh, a more savanna-like landscape. There might be trees in this landscape, um, but they're they're not touching. They're a little farther apart, um, and and you know sometimes there's a heavy shrub presence, or in some some of those plant communities, there's almost no shrubs, and it's just kind of a, a grassland type thing underneath it. So uh, forest, woodland, shrubland, and then the last one was a, a grassland uh, ecosystem. So things like the Eurasian steppe or uh, the North American prairie. Um, in these these drier habitats that uh, tend not to support trees. So for all, within all the all three of those categories have a, a huge different range of regional expressions um, and look very very different. But in terms of their basic dynamics, um, they're very similar to, to how the the plants um, within those systems work. Uh, And the other thing that was really appealing to us is that if you look at the best examples of any of those three archetypes, the patterns that the vegetation makes are, are very appealing. You know, a forest to think about, you know, a a beautiful ancient forest, big trees, space far apart. It tends not to be much of a shrub layer, you know, just a really sparkling expressive ground plane with lots of herbaceous plants on it. 
uh, you know, long views through it. You know, it's, it's a very appealing landscape. And the same thing with the savanna. Thinking about you know some of those trees, it's almost like a park-like landscape or even grasslands. They all tend to be very legible landscapes, and and it's there. Is is naturalism pulls away from each of these the, kind of the purest expression of these three in terms of the patterns. We that's when I find people react most negatively to naturalistic planting, you know, when, when it loses its legibility, when it loses its form, when it loses that kind of relationship to some archetypal pattern. So for us, the, the archetypes are one, just a way of organizing the vegetation uh, that gets away from um, the temptation to be too cosmopolitan with your plant list, you know, to, to pull plants from all over the world and, and not for them really to be internally related. So if, if, if your plant list is based in an archetype, they tend to be plants that have grown together or at least in a similar habitat. So that's one advantage that it does. But the, the big aesthetic advantage, we think, is that it really it drives a palette and drives spatial patterning in a way that reduces visual complexity and makes for much more emotional, um, appealing landscapes. For, for us, especially in small landscapes, the more archetypal it looks, the more emotional and spiritual it can feel. So, you know, we have an example of the um, a little courtyard in New York City, uh, a couple of courtyards, there's a couple of rooftop ones that have a little moment of grassland on the top of a skyscraper in New York. And then we have another example in the book of a little birch grove in the middle of the New York Times headquarter buildings. It's just a courtyard. It looks like a terrarium, essentially. But both of those examples, I think, are have, have done a really good job of keeping all of the plantings within an archetype. The ones on the roof are grasslands, and the one in the interior courtyard is kind of a, a woodland archetype. And because, you know, it's almost like a bonsai or pinging dish, because they really kept the reference so clean and pure, um, when you look at them, these little tiny spaces feel so expansive. They just kind of have a soaring and, and lifting emotional quality that I think um, that I think is the true power of naturalistic vegetation. You know, it's, it's different than bedding plants. It's different than highly artificial planting. It, it's when, a, when a combination can make you feel like walking through a meadow or hiking in a dark forest, I think that kind of emotional power that planting has is something that you really get when a planting... Um, has a strong echo of the archetype it comes from. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That I, I know exactly what you mean with that courtyard uh, in the New York Times building. It is exactly just a distillation of a, a landscape that, that everybody knows, probably. Um, right. So I was going to ask you about the different layers of plants that make up a successful design, but actually I'm not, because I'm not going to give away all your secrets. People will just have to buy the book. Um, <laughs> what I really wanted to ask you was, um, I think what... My question is, what does the future of landscape design look like to you? Because it sounds as if you can, you're witnessing a schism, um, you know, emerging. And I wonder if you think that is the way we're going to go. Are we going to have two polar opposite schools of thought moving forward? I, I hope not. I, I hope um, for us, I think we're optimistic about the future. I think we, we feel like um, the future really requires both ends of the schism, at least here in America, it really requires the use of um, wonderful native plants. It really requires uh, a knowledge of ecology and all the things that that side of the schism has. But I think more than ever, it needs design. You know, we need amazing artists um, who can uh, take a knowledge of ecology and, and these amazing uh, functional ecological plants that they're doing so much for pollinators and and for the environment in which they are and arrange them in ways that um, are appealing. I mean, I think that the work of Pete Aldolf, um, it's just, you know, this is an example is uh, a person who is an artist, but I think an artist who um, really kind of understands plants in an emotional way. Um, you know, the fact that the High Line in New York city is the most visited site in all of New York, um, which is a fairly amazing thing to me that a phony simulation of a meadow is something that more people want to see than anything else in New York, more than any building that, that says something about what a world that is increasingly urbanizes wants, you know, and, and that planting, which is amazing for pollinators, you know, that, that high line planting there 
is also amazing for humans. You know, it's a total win-win. That planting has changed real estate values around it. You know, horticulture has become the most exciting thing um, for people to see in New York. So when, when you see, now not everyone's peed out off, not everyone can do that, but you see when, when you get it right, you know, when you combine kind of ecology and artistry and frame it in a beautiful way, when you see what it can do, what it happens, um, that's when I, I think, you know, the schism will find integration and uh, we just need more projects like that. We just need bigger scale ones. We need versions of the high line that aren't so curated, you know, that have more self-sustaining populations that um, engage in bigger ecosystems. You know, you need it, need it all. The high line's very curated kind of museum like quality planting. Um, but, but it's just fabulous. And it, I think it's kind of raised the profile of what public planting can do. Um, at least here in America, and I think there are wonderful examples all over the world. Uh, but parks where ecological horticulture are front and center are some of the most visited parks all over the world. People are spending more time in them. Um, so I, I, while, while there's plenty of, I think, reasons to find, um, to be sad about schisms and, and debates and, and uh, horticultural world, you know, um, there's there's also just I think an incredible um, when 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 the conditions are right there's incredible hope uh, that can happen and we're we're very optimistic about that. Yes, there is lots to be optimistic about. Whichever way you think about design, there are big questions to be asked, and if they can't be conclusively answered, then certainly they need to be addressed sooner rather than later. I would love to see a panel discussion on this topic, maybe involving a few of the heavyweights of landscape architecture, design and ecology. That really would be a fascinating debate. If you would like to join Thomas for his planting masterclass that I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's in London in January. Um, You can simply Google LCGD Thomas Rayner or follow the link in the show notes through to Gillian Goodson's website where you can purchase your ticket. Or you can even email Gillian at GillianGoodson.com. I'd like to say thank you very much to Thomas for taking part in the interview. It was a real pleasure to ask him questions about his unique and sympathetic approach to design. And thank you to the London College of Garden Design for sponsoring this series and also to Gillian who put me in touch with Thomas. So a couple of things before I go. Apologies if you noticed my voice was slightly off. Um, I have been suffering from the dreaded lurgy. And if you haven't already seen on my social media channels, um, I actually did win the podcast of the year at the Garden Media Guild Awards um, for Roots and All. So I'm delighted with that. Um, And I'd like to thank everybody who's been listening and also all my guests and whatever you do to support me in any way that you do and and you do a lot. um, I would really like to thank you. It has paid off. So thank you for listening and I will catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.